Uh, are we, is God relevant then for us when we're hurting? Absolutely, because he enters into this and he helps us get sorry, back on track to become the people we were made to be. People who are made to love like God not judge like God. By the way, that's what that other tree in the Garden of Eden represents. The knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's the, the tree of, I now know what's right and wrong and I will use that to judge everybody rather than live in trusting relationship. Adam and Eve were made like God in the way that counts, to be lovers of humanity. We were not made like God to be judges. But we found a way to get good at that. Just to summarize what we've said so far, and then we'll look at the last two points. This is a napkin conversation, what I would call it. You can grab a napkin and draw this sometimes just to illustrate a point. Someone says, I can't believe in God because he's made such a horrible world. And I would say the Bible teaches that God's not the source of a horror. God has created freedom, and we need to own it. We need to own it. So, in fact, let me, let me just say this. I was interviewed by... Uh, by a television host for a CBC program uh, years ago. And he was obviously hostile, which is interesting because they came to our church, they did a lot of B-roll, they filmed stuff, and it's like they're doing a documentary, very pleasant, until it came to the interview and I realized the whole thing was a setup and they were just hostile. Now, I have days where I am a, I, I'm a bad communicator. You'll be the judge of whether this is one of those days. There are days where just my thoughts are muddled. There are other days where my brain is working. This happened to be one of those days where my brain was working. And as he would ask provocative questions, my answers, I think, were sound and were, and, and in some sense exposed that the questions themselves were just so laden with agenda that it's, they weren't making sense at some point. And you could see him getting angrier and angrier at what was, I thought, you know, could be a pleasant conversation, but he was, the, he won starting volleying the anger, and then he was getting angry that I wasn't getting angry back or getting flustered. It seemed like his only agenda was to fluster me. Finally, he ended the whole interview, and he said, listen, Bruxy, just look around you. Can't you admit that God effed up? Except he didn't say effed. To which I responded, I think it was quite simple. I said, no. I look around me and I see a world where God left us in charge and we effed up. Except I didn't say it. <laughs> and he just went, ah! And they went, they never used the interview. Praise the Lord. <laughs> uh, see, I knew you'd be blessed by that story. It's always good to have a Pentecostal in the group. So, some people say, look, God created this world, and this world is filled with terrible things like rape, abuse, loneliness, murder, slavery, unkindness, war, poverty, starvation, and country music. <laughs> in a world like this, how can we believe in God? We need to remove God from the equation. All right, so we do. Let's remove God from the equation. Guess what? It's all still there. It's all still there. So here's something that atheists and theists agree on. God's not the source. We are. It's our responsibility. The human heart says Jesus is the source. Mark chapter 7, he says, it's not what you take into you that makes you unclean, it's what comes out of you. Out of the heart is where all the bad stuff comes. And in the context, he's talking about religious rituals of cleanliness, what you may or may not eat. And he says, let's not fixate on the religious rituals rules, regulations, and routines of our religion, let's admit the fact that it's not really what goes into us that makes us clean or unclean. It's what comes out of the human heart. That's the locus of all of this. That's the source. So we're able to put God back in the equation and say that God has the power to enter. This is the hopeful message of Jesus, to enter and to change. To change. A... <laughs> well, you get my point. Number two, remember we're working backwards to one. Number two, God reveals his heart of unconditional love. When we are hurting, we need to be surrounded by love. And God, at least the God that Jesus tells us about, reveals to us a kind of love that is in some sense unprecedented in world religious history. This agape, agape is a Greek word that it appears as though the early writers within Christianity 
invented. Uh, agapeo as a verb had been used a few times uh, in ancient Greek literature, but not much. And so they grabbed this word and poured, never used as a noun, they grabbed this noun and poured meaning into it because God's love was somehow greater than could be simply expressed with this word or that word. So they kept heaping up different words and different ways to try and communicate it. That God has this thing called agape. And as we look at how the word is used, agape, their word for love is that love that is initiated by God and is unconditional toward us so that it is not because of something we do that earns it. It's simply because God chooses to love us. Now, he has made us in his image, and so he wants his image bearers to live up to that potential. If you're human, you are agape by God. You can't help it. There's nothing you can do to get God to love you more. There's nothing you can do to get God to love you less. You mess up. He loves you. You perform really well, he loves you. But that saves us from two extremes, the God doesn't care about me trap and the if I just perform better, if I just be a bit more religious, if I just, then God loves me. It's this amazing concept that is captured in another word the Bible uses, uh, charis or grace, 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 this gift, this gift. God just wants to lavish this gift of acceptance on us. And when we hurt, to be surrounded by this kind of love is one of the greatest gifts that we can have. God in scripture is revealed in a variety of ways, and these are just four of many. But one is the father. The father was the stern disciplinarian within that culture. And for the father to be recast in the parables of Jesus, like the father and the prodigal son, who even though he is abused and demeaned by his son, still comes running to embrace him when his son comes home who throws a party for a rebellious son who's willing to simply come back. That's all he has to do. This father who, remember the father figure both in the Greco-Roman world and within the Hebraic world, the stern authoritarian figure becomes the delighted lover in his kids. This is good father as the fatherhood of God. Mother too is used throughout the scriptures as, a, as an analogy of God, that God, uh, God takes care of us and nurtures us as a mother. For God is beyond gender. Male and female are made in his image. A lover, marriage, again, is an ongoing analogy that's used in scripture, that God wants to embrace us into his life, have a covenant relationship with us, but it's not just covenant relationship, but it's romantic, passionate, desire to be close and to be intimate relationship. And also friend, that he just wants to walk through life with us. When we're hurting, this God is incredibly relevant. To know that we have an advocate who's on our team, who is cheering for us, and who is working to bring good out of the suffering. Lastly, God not only reveals, but God relates to our greatest suffering. And I think this is one of the strongest points to be made, at least about the God Jesus tells us about. Let me read uh, these two quotes from two British theologians. John Stott, first of all, says, I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. In the real world of pain... How could one worship a God who was immune to it? There's something about the God of Jesus that shows us not only that God loves us, that not only reveals this, but that God relates to us. That, that God knows what it's like to hurt. God knows what it's like to be victimized. God knows what it's like to have friends abandon or betray him. God knows what it's like to suffer great loss. Michael Green writes, in Jesus, God has come to share our pain. God is no absent academic who writes a book on the problem of pain. He has gotten involved. He has allowed pain at its most severe to strike him. We worship a suffering God. That is the best answer to the problem of undeserved suffering. It's fascinating that that Christians have rallied around the cross, the crucifixion or the crucifix or any version of that to say this is center to our faith. But it captures something. It says that when God comes down among us, I mean, here's the story, the love story. We cause him pain. We cause him suffering. We do to him everything we've been doing to each other and doing to the planet. And then the planet does back to us. And we victimize God in the middle of this cyclone of hurt 
and suffering. And then God rises from the dead in Christ. That God actually takes a human journey through Jesus. God lives the human life and God suffers along with us. Rises the dead and unlike a great Greek or Roman God does not rise from the dead to exact his vengeance and throw lightning bolts on us but rises from the dead in order to say I forgive you. We can do better. I want to receive you. I'm still loving you the same way I did. Uh, let's start again. Let's be reborn. Let's be cleaned up. Let's live a new life. And he shows us how to do that. He teaches us how to do that, how to be doers instead of talkers. We're going to have Q&A in a second. Let me tell you one last thought. It's a story from uh, John chapter 9, when Jesus heals a blind guy. You know the story? There's a blind beggar. He's, he's doing what... What, what, on, what the only thing he could do is someone who was born blind. He has a congenital birth defect. He cannot see from birth. He's begging. John 9 tells us that Jesus and his disciples were walking along. The disciples saw him. They saw the beggar. And John 9 records that the disciples turned to Jesus and asked him a theological, philosophical question about why this person is suffering. They say, Jesus... Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Because within the Hebraic tradition, there is some kind of understanding of a limited version of karma, that someone might sin because of its adjusted karma, not the same as Hindu karma or Buddhist karma, but a karma that would say because of a parent's sin or an ancestor's sin, something can come back on us. Or if not their parent's sin, they actually believe, well, if the parents are righteous and yet the kid is born this way, that we have to blame the kid. How do we do that? Because So they came up with a theory of the possibility of sinning in utero. I don't know what he's doing in there. He's doing drugs at three months or, <laughs> you know, pimping at seven weeks. But whatever he's doing in there, it's possible that he's born blind because of some, something that he's... I've heard the same teaching in some, by some New Age authors today, by the way, uh, who have a strong sense of karma. We bring it upon ourselves. Um, don't get me started. I think that's a, well, I'm already started. But I, I do think that can be a terribly damaging way of looking at the world. It's attractive because it's, it's justice for people who wrestle with delayed gratification issues. Because we're not waiting for justice. The world is just always just right now. Something wrong happens, you deserve it. Something tragic happens, they brought it upon themselves. Justice. Justice. All the time. The world's always just but I think it leads to tremendous injustice and I believe that grace trumps karma all the time. So here the disciples ask, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Jesus says, neither rejecting the concept of karma, which he does elsewhere in his teaching as well. We will not re-victimize the victim. But, we, but Jesus says this, instead of then going on to answer the question, he rebukes the question. Don't even ask, neither sinned. Then Jesus says, but I will tell you this, this is an opportunity for God's glory to be revealed, which is code for it's miracle time. Do, 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 miracle time. So then Jesus heals him as an example of what his disciples need to do. Stop stopping and having only conversations about what's wrong, asking the question why, but become doers and changers, made in the image of God, reaching out, taking responsibility for the planet, for all creation, including and especially other image bearers of God. And so Jesus heals him. He heals him in a strange way too, by the way. You, you know the story. He, he grabs some dirt, and then he <laughs> spits in the dirt. And I'm sure at this point his disciples are singing, what do you think's wrong with Jesus? I think he's, <laughs> he's had a stressful day. He's having a time out. We'll just leave him. Spits in it, and then he starts to muck the dirt around. You know the story? And he makes mud out of the dirt mixed with his spit. I can see Peter, James, and John going, should we like remind him that he was on his way to heal somebody? No, it's okay. You know, he's getting in touch with his inner child. Just let the dude uh, have a moment. And then uh, they're wondering you know, how Jesus is doing. And then finally, Jesus takes this mud that he's made, and he starts to walk towards the blind guy. Do you know, you know the story? He's walking towards him. Now, here's the interesting thing. The guy's blind. He doesn't see it coming. Right? <laughs> So he's just there begging. Jesus is walking towards him with the mud. I can see the moral dilemma over here. Peter, James, and John are going, should somebody like warn the blind guy? No, no, this will be interesting. Just, uh... 
Jesus puts the mud in his eyes, then sends him to the pool of Siloam. He washes off there and he's healed. Fascinating. He's healed that way. Later we read in John 9, the religious people launch an all-out investigation about this healing. Why? Because it was on the Sabbath. And not just that it was wrong to heal on the Sabbath. Within their framework, what did Jesus do? We read within the Mishnah, which codifies and organizes the the oral Torah, the tradition of the elders, the religious rules of Jesus' day. We learn within that that it was actually unlawful to make mud or clay or anything like that that would resemble that on the Sabbath because that was considered work. You couldn't even mix an ointment for healing if it needed different ingredients. You had to do that the day before. You could use it, but you couldn't, you couldn't mix it on. So Jesus also, I think, acknowledging that sometimes religion is Part of the problem, not part of the solution. Jesus says, religious people, please, here's mud in your eye. You've got to bust through all of the traditions and the safety-keeping parameters that you have built around yourself, the walls that keep you feeling safe, and make a difference. Love radically and care. This becomes the message of Jesus that he not only teaches, he emulates, he lives It's the God he introduces us to. Is God relevant in the midst of suffering? Couldn't be more so. Okay, that's my talk. Let's throw it open to Q&A. I guess while we're waiting for people to come up, we can start with um, a question from a text. Um, How do you reconcile this Hebraic tradition of karma to the book of Job found in the Hebrew scriptures where Job is praised for his righteousness and still suffers. Right. We reconcile it because the Hebraic tradition of karma is wrong and rebuked by Jesus. There is much about any religion. This is true about the Jewish religion, the Christian religion that I'm a part of, or any other religion. There's much, there's much about every religion that heaps on beliefs on top of what the core DNA of that faith is. Uh, and Jesus rebuked his fellow countrymen, his fellow Jews for that. He, as did the prophets in the Old Testament, don't add on to what God's already said. He says in Mark chapter 7, you have an amazing way of following your own traditions while you abandon what the word of God actually says in Mark tradition. And that Hebraic tradition of karma was one of those things that Jesus said, you've taken too far. And sometimes in every tradition, in every blindness, there's a seed of truth. There's something there. There's a nugget. But they take it too far and they use it as a club to hurt people with. And, and they miss the opportunity to help. Uh, so we, we reconcile it by not reconciling it, by rejecting the one and embracing the way of grace. Good. Thanks for that question. Um, so just another one, I guess, here. Um, does God allow suffering to test our faith? Uh, there's a myriad of possibilities why God may, in some instance, allow suffering. What we can say is, in general, there is an overarching story of the Bible that says God has left us in charge. We've messed up. Suffering is the result. God wants to work with us to help make it right. And that is the overarching theme of all of Scripture. Having said that, there are cases within that where suffering may result from a very specific thing. So Jesus says, don't blame the blind guy because he's blind. But there may be cases where suffering comes upon us because of a stupid choice we made. So we don't say it's always this or it's always that. What we say is we give people the benefit of the doubt. We don't re-victimize the victim. But there may be times where suffering comes because of, uh, of choices we've made or choices someone else has made. There may be times when suffering comes because God has allowed a specific measure of suffering within someone's life who's just getting, frankly, too full of themselves and too content with their own amazingness to become the loving person God's designed them to be. And sometimes some hardship is what it takes for someone to grow out of that phase. So it could be on occasion that we can't always know why. So we, why in each particular case someone's suffering, we give them the benefit of the doubt and we say, I may never know why, that's okay. But I do know what I'm supposed to do next. And that's help. Um, So Brooksy, you mentioned in your talk, we work to become the answer to our own prayer. What do you mean by that? Yeah, great. When we pray in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Guess who should be excited about partnering with that will, following that will? First and foremost should be the person praying the prayer. Uh, When I say your will be done, your kingdom, I'm not just praying, God, go and get everybody else to 
to live the way you want them to live. I'm praying for myself as well, that I will become the answer to that. Jesus says the same thing when, uh, when he wants this message of love to spread. In Mark chapter nine, he says, people are ready for the message. The problem is that there's not enough carriers of the message. He uses an agricultural metaphor. He says, the harvest is ready for harvesting. The problem is that the laborers are few. We don't have enough laborers to bring in the harvest. People are ready for the message. There's not enough people to carry the message to them. So he says, I want you to pray that God will create more messengers, that they pray that there will be more laborers to get into the harvest field. Well, who's that? That's us. We're actually praying that we will become more motivated to carry this message forward. So whenever you're praying for God to do something on the planet, God, please make this right. Please, please bring more peace. Please bring more. While you're praying that, also pray with awareness that he may be calling you to partner with the answer to your own prayer. So you're saying, how can I now, when I'm done this prayer, how can I stand up, walk out the door, and live differently in alignment with what I've just prayed for God to do? Um, so the Bible does reference children living with the iniquity of their father's sin. Yes. Does that not imply we live with a predetermined burden? Uh, it, no, what, the Bible records something that we all know to be true, is that often, in some cases, not all, uh, we, a child is born with something wrong because of what their parents did. We can't rule that out as one of the reasons. We simply can't default to that as the explanation for everything that's wrong when someone's born with a defect. So when a child is born with fetal alcohol syndrome, we know why that happened. Choices that the mother made, and that can happen. We also know that in God's covenant with Israel, at times God says, whenever I would bless them, Israel would get selfish and depart and walk away and forget about me. Whenever I would allow calamity to come into their lives, uh, they would return to me and they would seek truth. So there are times in their situations where it's true, uh, a child may be born because, uh, with something wrong with them because of something that their parents have done. So we don't rule that out. What Jesus is saying is don't turn to that as your default explanation for anything. Just when you think, oh, I've got the answer to why this happened, you could be dead wrong. So stop asking that question and ask the question instead of why did this happen, the question is what can I do to help? Um, so why would Jesus um, have to suffer for what the world did? Is that being fair to Jesus? Great question. The, the quick answer is he didn't have to. It didn't, he didn't have to at all. Uh, but it was his choice, it was his choice to come and to demonstrate his love for us. As he demonstrates his love for us, we reject him, we turn on him, and then he makes another choice, not to retaliate, but to endure. We continue to betray, to abandon, to walk away, to crucify him, he still makes the choice. He makes the choice to love. He makes the choice on the cross to pray for the forgiveness of those who are killing him. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He shows us the heart of God that no matter what we do to him, what we do to him, he still believes better in us, prays for our forgiveness, and wants to give us another chance, another chance, another chance. So he didn't have to. He chose to keep loving us. So that as he resurrects and comes to us with this message of God's love, if we really stare into the story, we can say, yeah, I get it. I, I believe it. You've proven it. You've demonstrated. In some sense, Jesus is God's show and tell. He's not just his tell. He's his show and tell. And we can really say, yeah. Because sometimes when we go through really hard times, you know what we start to feel? We feel like God doesn't love us or God's abandoned us. But when we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, we say, no. No, even when I'm hurting, I know that I'm praying to the God who hurts. I'll say this. When you want to talk to someone about your suffering, you can talk to a professional. You can talk to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, psychotherapist. You can talk to a clergy person. You can talk to anybody who can give you wisdom and can help you. But there's nothing quite as healing as talking to someone who's been through the exact same thing you're going through. That's why we start support groups with people going through hard times, where they can just get together with other people like them who have gone through the same thing. And the beautiful thing is when you pray to God, if you pray to him tonight, one of the things God can say is, yeah, I know, I've been there. I've experienced that. I know what it's like. It hurts. 
And we know that that's true when we look at the life of Christ. He didn't have to, he chose to. 